thank you. Good to see you all and to have such a wonderful global uh, audience participating. Uh, first of all, um, I think it's wonderful that you're setting aside time to learn more about our practice. Um, I will give you the best I have. Um, it has been my good fortune in my career to work all over the world. I, I, feel, I feel very fortunate, especially these days. And I've seen so many different types of schools in so many different types of conditions. But the one thing that really resonates for me is how proud I am to be an educator. And so I look forward to having an hour with you as colleagues. And I wanna share with you my experience with mapping. Um, as we noted in the first session, I began this model of curriculum mapping in my first book on mapping, which was published in 1997. And through my career, um, it has evolved dramatically. And so has been the demands on how to lay out plans that make sense. And so have the tools. And I remember <laughs> when we used to have binders and we used to have on, on faculty walls, there'd be big pieces of paper and we'd be posting and, and putting down what we might do. But now we, we can use platforms that are just make life so much faster, but also are, are necessary given how knowledge has grown. So I want to thank Chalk for inviting me um, to participate with you. I work with many software groups and I have great regard for Chalk. So thank you. So let's start. Last time, let's do a little recap. Uh, last time I was laying out four phases for implementing mapping. I have developed a model for, in four phases based on years of work. And this model is very um, uh, responsive. So whether I'm working with a small school in rural, rural Minnesota, or whether I'm working in Auckland in New Zealand, and I'm, I've got a group of schools there on the North Island, and we're, we're looking how each of those in very different environments might lay out their work, or I'm working in the state of Texas with a large district. This model works very well, it's adaptive. So first of all, we established that you've got to map for a reason and there's got to be a purpose. If you have teachers saying, I don't know why I'm doing it, then you're, you're, you've lost. We got to really know why we're doing it. And there's so many reasons. So we'll, we'll review a few of those in a moment. Today, we're going to work on the second phase, which is critical. And that is you can have a reason and a mission. And you might even say the main reason we're mapping is our standards. But if you don't have quality mapping, and it's cut and paste, then it's all very superficial. In fact, I would say it's design superficiality. What we want is a mapping, um, a, a set of documents and a, and a set of maps that grow, that continue to evolve. Let's be clear, you never finish this work. You're never gonna be finished. You can't say one day, oh, knowledge stopped. We're gonna keep growing and that's the beauty of what we do. And we also know our students, vary and change. We need to have an ability, which is our third phase, which we'll get into in our last session. We need to be able to review and revise and, and, and look at, at, at how they're performing with a whole array of assessments, all kinds of demonstrations. What do we do when we find our kids have a gap? We have, a, have to have a place to go and a process for review. And we'll also deal with the last phase. We'll combine these, where we look at keeping maps modern, keeping them current, making sure that we have a, a, a process for sustaining the work. So let's go to the next slide. So one thing in, in reviewing what we did last time, and you may, for those of you who joined us last time, you may be thinking about um, what you started in, what your reason was, and, and it may be, it's changed. I, I can tell you that happens. I've started with a lot of schools who started with standards and then suddenly they start to go, you know what? We really have a dated curriculum. We need to look at, at, at elevating it, making it stronger. So there's an entry point, but once you get into this work, there's a lot of other problems and ways you can, and, and, and ways you can address those problems and other possibilities that emerge. Some of the ones we raised last time were gaining information finding out what's going on in the school, avoiding redundancy and repetition, 
identifying gaps, which is always a very, very good reason, locating potential areas for integration, matching with the standards that you're, you decided to set as your priorities, examining, examining for timeliness and editing for coherence. Next slide, please. So the other piece that I thought was particularly important to raise was that if you're going to make this work, you've got to have a reason, a why, but you've got to have a who. And so the key here is to work with a curriculum task force, no matter how small the school, not just one person, or not just necessarily by role, like all the principals. It's, it's got to be people who have the talent and ability and also have the leadership to begin to lay out what will work in your school setting. So you get the right people to begin doing the R&D, the research and de development that will be necessary for this work. They also may be doing the consumer investigation of what platform to use. So a purpose, a group that will begin to look at possibilities. And then I think you can start working through and getting ready to move to that, that next phase, which we're going to get into today. Okay, there we go. So, oops. I think I had it and you had it. There we are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, that's okay. It was fun. It was, I enjoyed it. It was cool. <laughs> what we're looking at is also then the platform that you'll work on. I, believe me, I've worked with people who use Google Docs all the time. I think that's legit. I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to start. But you're going to find it very hard to go through all those folders. There's no search capability it becomes a good electronic storage bin. However, I think it's perfectly fine to begin um, by learning how to write quality work, put your templates in there and get better at it. Then when you do get an electronic format, a digital format, it'll be much easier. But one way or another, you're gonna want a platform that supports immediacy and good communication. Keenan, why don't you show them a little bit about Chalk for a moment? Sure, uh, thanks Heidi. So very quickly, we'll jump in just to kind of give you an idea uh, of what chalk is and how it can be used for schools all around the world. So we have a lot of different solutions available and we'll primarily be focusing on our curriculum solution today as we're walking through and showing some examples that Heidi's going to speak to. Um, but we are essentially a tool that can be used for uh, primarily teachers. Honestly, that's where we focused. We started as a planning tool and we've evolved from there. Um, and we'll actually be able to show you some of those features later on today. But as, whether you're an elementary teacher or a high school teacher or anything in between, um, we have tools that make it a little bit easier uh, to organize your resources. We have mobile apps. So plan board is available on your phone and iPad and things like that. It's used by educators around the world uh, and it's free to get started with plan board. Um, but today we will be spending some time talking about the curriculum aspect. Um, this is just a view of our dashboard we can see here where we'll be diving into curriculum. I'll just give you a quick sneak peek of what plan board does look like, where as an educator, you can really structure it to meet your needs to keep your plans and resources organized in one place. Um, but we'll go ahead and jump ahead into the presentation. And as Heidi's going through, we'll be able to highlight some of the ways that Chalk is able to help with some of the things that we're talking about today. Thank you, Keenan. So let's go here. So we're going to now go officially to our, our next piece. When we look at laying out a quality curriculum, we talked about last time how there's various perspectives. There's the K-12 perspective, the big picture. And as I mentioned last time, the root word of curriculum is the path to run in small steps. I love that, I just love that root word. And in a sense, as a teacher, I am going to be laying out my path through the year and I'm, I'm looking at how I orchestrate my units as I lay them out, as you can see here. So what we look at is there is unit one on big geography, peopling of the earth. I'm laying that August through early September and so forth. But there's also the, the big picture vertically. So if this is, for example, uh, let's say it's a grade nine class, what I'm looking for is not only grade nine, but what will be coming and what will, um, and what is, what is preceded this year. That the more I know and I'm able to see how my work is part of that big picture, that's really important. The first book I wrote on mapping was called Mapping a Big Picture. 
And, and that to me was often what was missing. And although a state ed department or a provincial headquarters or a national government can lay out a big picture, it isn't necessarily what's really happening in school. In other words, there's the proposed itinerary and then there's what really happens on the trip. How many of you have had a trip plan and other things come along? Well, welcome to real life in school. But, but the guidelines said that our students would have it all, would, have, would all be reading on grade level by the end of grade three. Well, that isn't how it works. And you also have some kids who move faster and some who struggled. So part of what we really want to do is it's a planning tool, but it's a reality check. We really are looking at how we actually spend our time as we lay it out and what makes sense. So in looking at quality, we're looking at realism and we're also looking to see that things connect. Um, let me give you a quick um, uh, example of something I, I said the other day to a, um, a sixth grade teacher in math. He was lovely. We were having a great conversation. And I said, don't you have to agree? I said, would you agree with me? There's no such thing as sixth grade math. And he looked at me and then he started laughing. He said, I think I know what you mean. I said, that's right. It's six, five, four, three, two, one K math. Students just don't suddenly walk into sixth grade and go, oh, this is a whole new shop. You are so dependent on what kids have done in previous years. So what this does when, you, when you're able to step back is you can lay out the plan of your year, but you can go up Periscope and see what's preceded and see what's coming. So as we look at these, here's where the rubber meets the road. I want you to notice that when we start, we have this first unit and then in a second, let's talk about this idea of the unit. So, the unit level to me is where you get your chops. And that's kind of a, a term that we use sometimes um, in New York to talk about you really know your stuff. And the unit level is where the architecture is. It's where you're deciding what's in this experience, what's not, what to cut, what to keep, what to create, how you're going to frame it. And you have to make your unit plan realistic for the setting you have, the resources you have, and more than anything, those kids. So when we're designing a unit, what I think is important in planning on mapping is not to do cut and paste, not to just take some chapter heading from a textbook and throw it in here, because that is not necessarily what you're doing, but more importantly, to design that unit to meet the needs of your students. You know. I think kids know when you're running on empty. I think kids know when a teacher is just doing cut and paste because you teach in a cut and paste way. And they know when you've put energy into your work, when you own it. Um, like I say often, someone was saying to me uh, recently, well, you know, um, let's take something like Hamlet. They were saying the play Hamlet, Shakespeare. They said, you know, teachers teach Hamlet. I'm going, wait a minute. Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. Hamlet's a play. It can be taught very poorly. Generally speaking, we think it's a pretty good play. But think of all the ways you could botch that. And think of all the ways you could play with that, design that experience, create that unit design to make it engaging or to make it a total turnoff. You are a designer. You're composing. You are creating a composition on how you'll take anything that you have to work on and try to make it as engaging as possible. Or you can just cover it and then we can blame the kids. So let's take a look a little further here. When we look at unit design and we're looking at the elements in unit design, one of the first things that I think is important and to me is something that I've written about more in the last maybe five to 10 years. And now I'm take, I've been taking an even, even deeper dive. And I didn't write about so much at first because it became really clear to me after looking at so many maps that we were losing an opportunity. If we're designing this work to be engaging, then the title of that unit, the focus of that unit really matters. Now I have called you composers and I really believe that. Um, 
when I taught for a long time at Columbia University, where I got my doctorate here in New York, um, at Teachers College. And on occasion, I have an opportunity to continue having great moments as a, a, with, with students in that way. But if I'm working, let's say, with a faculty in a, in, a, in a high school or an elementary school, I still teach this way. And that is, I teach curriculum design as a form of creative writing. So I do this as a creative writing opportunity because you're creating in the unit learning opportunities. And in writing, you make choices. And one of the most important choices as a writer is the genre. So let's pretend for a moment, uh, I am a literature teacher and Keenan, you are my student. Are you ready? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> okay. Well, now come on, are you ready? Of course, ready to go. Yeah, that's more like it. Okay. Let's say uh, we're looking and I want you to create a writing class. And one of the first things I'll say is, Keenan, I know you have a story you want to tell, but there's a lot of different genre. There's a lot of different forms. You could do memoir. You could do a vignette. You could do a short story. You could write a novel. You could write a poem. But you need to choose the form that'll best match your message. And I teach that way because I recognize that different formats actually make a big difference on the match between the message. So with that in mind, as a curriculum designer, I would say a lot of times, arguably, when units aren't going very well, it's because the teachers didn't choose a, a genre match. Years ago, I was asked by the college board to write about this in a book on interdisciplinarity they published. And I have been doing a lot of thinking and, and, and writing and presenting on it. And it helped me put it together. And most recently, I've, I've included it in all of my more recent books. And anytime I share this with teachers, I really like it. So I'm looking at a bunch of maps and all I see are topical headers. So I'm saying to the kids, we're doing a unit on measurement. You're doing a unit on cell tissue. You're doing a unit on the French Revolution, whatever it is. Topics, 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 which is way, there's way too much of it. Topics are fine as a genre choice. That's one of your choices. If it's the first time you've introduced something, it's really more background information. And it's very, very clear. It's a kind of subject matter catchment. You know how you know you have a, you have a topic? Because you could find it in an encyclopedia. So I could find the French Revolution in the encyclopedia, but not revolution because that's not a topic, that's a theme. Conflict is a theme, patterns are a theme. And what we start to see is another option is something thematic, which deals with a conceptual emphasis, often interdisciplinary, and it gives me another a choice. Is it better? No, it's another way I can go. Here's another option I have. I can cast my unit as a problem. If it's problem-based, then there is an actual problem situation. And so our focus in the, in the unit will be on finding a solution. That's why we do it. So the point here so far is topics are information based. We're trying to get information. Themes are we're exploring conceptual understandings that may be cross, get across disciplines. Problems are to investigate a problem situation to create a solution. Issues, which are great, Issue-based investigations are based on exploring a point of controversy that can never be resolved. Issues cannot be resolved. They can't, otherwise they're not issues. They can't. Unfortunately, we'll never, we'll never solve the issue, I think, of sexism, for example. I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I don't see that. But we can explore the perspectives people have. Are we gonna ever resolve censorship? Mm -mm. Nope, we'll explore why people value what they do. And right now in such a divisive time in such a difficult time, it's extremely important to understand why people feel so strongly about issues. So the purpose of an issue-based investigation is to examine perspectives. Case studies are terrific and they can be in any subject in any area where we zoom in and we're spending our unit really looking at a specific instance, a specific situation, a specific place, or a, a specific set of books. Let me give you some examples, because then these are all from curriculum maps. And I want to show you how 
simply by shifting the title and the focus of something required gives the unit juice and it allows kids to really be much more um, excited about their learning. Okay, I need you to go to, there it is, all right. I'm clicking, I need you to move it. There we, oops, too far, back one. Uh, let's go back. Uh, something happened here. Can we go back to, um, back one, back, let's go to the front end of those. It, solar energy is the first one. One more. Back one, please. This is the first one, I think, the solar energy one. The, the solar energy one. This one's the first one now. I had yep. solar energy before. Okay, that's all right. Let's just go to the next one. Sorry about that. We will get it down. This was the first one. Yeah, this is the one I, I wanted. Um, this is uh, an example of taking the topic of solar energy which is totally legitimate. But if I've studied it and I see that on my map, on a curriculum map, and they studied it, let's say in fifth grade on my eighth grade, then I don't think I should be doing it again as a topic. We might be doing the theme of sustainability. We might be looking at sustainability, not only in the environment, but sustainability, let's say in communities, in terms of, in terms of sustaining a leadership position or, how do, we, how do we maintain and sustain um, components of a neighborhood? There's all kinds of ways we could look at it. If we look at this, if we look at this issue of problems, you could design how to design a solar collector to run our high school. That would be a really interesting challenge-based unit and you'd still be getting at your basic information. This one, Conservation Versus Jobs, is literally from a middle school I worked with in Juneau, Alaska. And there is a rainforest in near Juno. And the debate, they're not gonna solve, they're not gonna resolve it. There's gonna always be people who are gonna say, no, we need the jobs, and others who say conserve. Okay, but what's behind the positions? So that investigation was a really interesting one, or a case study. Next slide, please. Thanks. So in this instance, the topic was measurement. This is elementary. But instead of doing measurement, this particular school has a school, it's a school-wide magnet and it's, it's called on the job in the world. And so everything's career oriented. So what they looked at is they, would, they began to look at how to engage kids in using measurement in a lot of different job situations. It was terrific, but that is another option. And quick point, I'm not saying you do all of these, not at all. I'm just saying that open up your menu and you can start to breathe and, the, and, and writing curriculum becomes kind of fun, kind of exciting. Or the problem, how to improve safety at a local amusement park. And um, another was the issue of safety versus thrill. Who decides who rides? Uh, one of the rides, it was by height, not age. Or you know, what, what is the question here about even the design of these park rides and, and examining some of the problems with amusement park design and where there've been a preponderance of, of accidents. It was fascinating. The last one was a case study on one specific um, ride at the park. And what I loved about it was applied mathematics, but the students in any of these instances would have an opportunity to take it further. Next slide, please. Thank you. How are we doing on that? Sorry, is it, I, don't, I don't know if it's not showing. I switched to the World War One. Is that showing on your end? Yeah, it is now. But it, oh, okay. Or I think maybe it just takes a beat. Yeah, I and think then, there's a delay. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not sure why that's. Yeah. We're all getting used to it. I think there's a nice time to pause and take deep breathing, so it's all good. We'll it <laughs> all right. So, this idea of um, World War Two and making it, it could be a clash of civilizations or how to design a virtual World War II museum or this fabulous issue-based question, was World War II inevitable? There's very different perspectives on this. And then the last one, life on the home front, life on the war front. We could continue in that regard and look at case studies. Next slide, please. 
And then we could be looking at the pandemic and the question of the theme or the notion of quarantine, not, not only about the pandemic, pandemic, but what happens when we're cordoned off? What happens when people are set aside? What happens when we withdraw? What does that do? There's literature that we could look at that would, would play into this at different levels. The problem, how to return to school with social distancing or who decides who, who is essential in a pandemic. That's a really tough issue. And then case studies on comparing global responses. Here's the point. Sometimes when people start mapping, they just jump into taking what they've done and putting it in. I think it's an opportunity. I think it's an opportunity to hit the refresh button. You know, another Latin word is revision and revision comes from revisere, which means to see again. So the goal here is to see our curriculum with fresh eyes. Next slide, please. So as we look at what we're going to frame, some of the key elements we look at in our unit designs are essential questions of big ideas. And those are have enormous importance. Otherwise, there's a tendency to jump to content and skills and just start covering. In other words, here's the content now in my unit on sustainability. There's it's good content and skills as opposed to framing it through the lens of inquiry. Next slide, please. So essential questions are really fascinating to me. The word essential comes from a Latin root word, esse, which means to be. You know, it's to distill to the core what matters most. It also gets us to push away that which is not essential. So the essential question is, has a different function than other kinds of questions. It provides focus and direction to engage learners in fulfilling the mission of, of the quest. And notice the root word question is quest. It's a search. And so what we're looking at is, is, is how these can be of value. A couple critical points that I think sometimes get missed here. Um, mental Velcro. Years ago, I wrote about this and I started to call essential questions a form of mental Velcro. And part of that is I was doing a lot of work on active literacy, research for a, a book I was doing and my own sort of investigations on what allowed students to be more fully communicative. And one thing I learned about was of course something any of you who've had experience in reading and the study of reading. And I bet if I, if I asked, a lot of you would put up your, yes, I, I do a lot of work in reading research. No, the power of advanced organizers. So um, an advanced organizer increases recall of information three or four folds. So what does that mean? That means um, my paper, my newspaper of choice is the New York Times. So let's say, Keenan, um, I, I ask you to look at the digital edition of the New York Times. And right now, in the, in the timely way we're discussing, we're looking right now at the impact or um, how, what is the rollout, rollout of the vaccines? What is the impact of the rollout in different countries and how is it affecting statistics in people's lives? Well, let's just say I ask you to read the New York Times and then after I ask you that qu those questions, you might remember a little bit, but if I give you those questions in advance, when you read through and I say everything that sticks to these questions like Velcro, that's what we're gonna talk about. You'll pay attention to them. You'll notice them. Do you remember a few moments ago, I showed the slide about World War II. So if I were to say to the class, our essential question is, was World War II inevitable? Could it have been avoided? All right, today, I'm gonna to show you a documentary about the, the beginnings of World War II. And at the end of the class, we're gonna ask, was it inevitable? So as you watch this film, that's what I'm gonna ask you to note. When you use essential questions, it helps kids stick. And, and because essential questions are not right and wrong, they never are, There's not, they're always open-ended. Are we clear about that? They're always an inquiry question. It allows students to gather in a lot of their observations. It is a literacy tool. It really is. It helps kids focus. And it keeps, it keeps 
the kids focus, but guess who else it keeps focused? Us. Teachers can get off track. There, I'm saying it out loud. We can get distracted. And so it's saying, this is what we're working on. And it's a real aid for knowledge retention. Now, I'm going to try to move it forward myself. Let's see how it goes. See, I just tried. And, oh, wait, did it work? Yeah, I think when you do it, I, I see it right away. But I think there's a slight delay. Um, I'm good with either way, whatever, whatever is easier for you though. Well, that's, that's a new essential question. How can we get this thing to work better? But that's, another <laughs> that's very open-ended. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> I definitely appears we don't have a right answer for that one yet. Okay. So why do we need them? We need them because they improve communication between teachers. We need them. And here's an important one because they help us get away from the potpourri problem. That's particularly true in interdisciplinary work where you don't want it to be, there's a sampling of a little bit of math and a little bit of social studies and a little bit of this. It helps us frame, but not in a rigid way, in an inquiry way, it brackets a little bit. It helps frame the connections. It's absolutely critical for alignment in your maps. And we'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. And I'm gonna do a preview of coming attractions. So if you're really listening right now, I want you to listen to this because it's coming. We're gonna use color coding and you'll see what I mean by this in a moment because it is beautiful the way that essential questions can help you be sure that what you're organizing and framing is focused and very nicely organized, but still flexible. It increases long-term outcomes, it aligns to what your mission and outcomes are, it can clarify your purpose and it's superb for communication between students and teacher. Okay, now I'm gonna click, let's see what happens. Great. So what's so big about a big idea? What's its relationship to the essential question? Understandings of big ideas are extremely important. Uh, basically what it is, just in most fundamental way, is the big idea or the understanding, whatever term you want, I'm gonna use big idea now, is married to the essential question. They're married. You don't have a bunch of lists of big ideas over here. That doesn't work in the architecture and disrelated, unrelated, essential questions. For every big idea, there is a corresponding question. The big idea is a complete sentence. I just need to make that clear. It is a statement. It's a conceptual statement that says, this is the idea that we want to have transfer, that we want to make sure students wrestle with. It isn't a factoid. It's a concept that's converted into a question. Key point. The essential question is written for the student. Can I say that one more time? The essential question is written for the student. It, they're your audience. So we have a big idea paired with an essential question. That way we're really anchoring it. Why does that matter? Because it's very easy to get kind of flipped with essential questions, to be perfectly honest. It, it, oh, we can do this question and this question, and this question. You gotta slow down here. You've got to look at what's what's the conceptual anchors for what you're working on? What's the ideas that are really critical as you're working on, on a math concept in algebra? What is, what is it you really want them to understand when you're looking at a concept in social studies or in the sciences at any level? And how can we convert that into a question for inquiry? It really allows it to have more depth. And I think that's a critical piece. So let's go to the next one. Hmm. Let's see, try again. Okay, here's some examples of big ideas matched corresponding EQs. So the big idea here is the geographical location of a culture largely determines its social, political, and economic possibilities. Location, location, location. You know, geography is human destiny. And this is a big idea. And we really want our students to be able to see that as they look. So instead of just saying, how long is the Nile, which isn't an essential question, it's an interesting question, but that's not it. We're saying, how is the Nile Egypt's destiny? I noticed someone from Egypt is on our program today too. And it's an amazing country. I am so glad that you're joining us. Um, and, and the truth is the Nile really was its destiny. And so what that allows us to do as, is look at the notion of, of the impact of land on possibilities, on relationships with other places, on sustaining their environment. And, and then we can begin to lay out our work. 
maybe we have another big idea on our Egypt unit. Um, what were the contributions or how, what were the contributions of Egypt to civilization? And some of those are very positive, but some were not, you know, putting people into slavery to build structures isn't necessarily a great contribution. On the other hand, the way they began to look at everything from the stars to irrigation to, you know, it, it's a fascinating question. Now, let me just throw this out to, to all of you. Um, if I were to talk to any of the teachers that listening right now, we've got well over 400 right now. And I know some of you have taught units on Egypt. And I were to say to you, let's say you're a sixth grade teacher. And I were to say, how many weeks did you have on Egypt to, to, to spend, to work on? And they might say, oh, we had about four weeks and I'll go, that's hard. Four weeks on 5,000 years of one of the greatest civilizations, you're gonna to have to leave out a lot. How can be able to do everything? So the point is, is you're saying, what's essential for my sixth graders, given the time we have? Now stop, because here's the other thing. If in fact, you're the first person to introduce Egypt, it's probably a good idea you start topically. It really is, you know, you're gonna do that. But organizing around a set of essential questions, you're not gonna do everything on every Pharaoh. You're not gonna do everything, but you're gonna teach them about where it was and the contributions that you could do. So the question here is essential questions help us deal with the question of, I can't do everything. So how can I frame it in a way to make this work? When I look at the rainforest, this question, this is a, um, a wonderful um, big idea. The natural world is comprised of systems with interdependent component parts. Instead of just saying, um, uh, what does the rainforest look like? And that idea allows us to start to see the different levels, the different layers, whether we're looking at the canopy or, you know, the, the, the idea then is what happens when a system doesn't work? It falls apart. So how does the rainforest work as a system allows us to start to look at the way we have to care for it, its impact. But watch this, next year, those students are going to be studying government and they're gonna to start to look at government as a system and what happens when one part of it doesn't work or the human anatomy as a system. So the idea is the concept behind the big idea travels and the questions are designed in such a way to frame it. Can we go to the next slide, please? Is that showing on your end? No. Yeah, now it is. Okay. I think, you're, I think it, there's a, for some reason, there's a delay. That's okay. So one important thing here, because this is so critical in our maps, is that essential questions are different from instructional questions. They are. You can have, a, you, your essential questions have, have the role, play the role of organizers and framers. And you'll see what I'm getting at in a moment. We'll show you an example or two. The color coding really makes that true, uh, clear. But, but they also um, are, are absolutely designed to get students to start to gather and bring in their own points of view. Instructional questions can be more, uh, more finite, more granular, more specific, and they're critical. Um, you might set up a discussion for, to have opinions on an issue. You might have uh, instructional questions that ask for a right or wrong answer, like, uh, you know, what's the capital of Cairo, or capital of Egypt? Or, Whatever it is you're working on, there's no reason not to have instructional questions. The point here is how we can frame them. Um, did you want to show us uh, something here, Keenan? Sure. Yeah. So let's uh, we'll just switch over to chalk here and wanted to show you a couple of examples, really kind of leaning into a lot of what uh, Dr. Heidi Jacobs was just going through of uh, tying the big ideas with the essential questions and taking advantage of things like color coding kind of see how those pieces fit together. Um, so we've got a couple of examples here starting, we've got our sixth grade, sixth grade social studies, um, first unit here focusing on the struggle of a new nation. And if we dive into this unit here, we can see how the way that the unit template has been structured allows for whether you're a teacher or a curriculum creator, um, when you're putting that content in to align, you have your big ideas here in this left column and then 
right next to them the associated essential question, as well as any underlying instructional questions that would go with that. You so did you want to jump in? For just a minute, because I want to, I think sure. it's a little hard to see. Yeah, let's just, I have a hunch people will appreciate this. Let me show you something here. Um, what you see is this teacher is, is basically got a very good big idea. Conflict emerges when groups of people confront differing social, economic, and political values. The first essential question, what are the roots of conflict between people? Then there's a whole set of instructional questions. Let's go to the next one. Sure. Geography influences people's decision-making. How does geography influence lifestyle and point of view? So you can see the match, but I want you to notice that this is in blue and in red because where we're gonna go with this is, and, and I'm gonna show you a graphic in a minute, is that each of these questions is like a curriculum chapter. So that means then when we end up getting to content and skills, what belongs in this question? So let's go to another one. Uh, let's go to that second grade one, just to show another grade level. Sure, so I'll just slide over a little bit here. This is called Miles and Miles of Measurement, Our Union Station. It was from an elementary school I worked with in, in New Haven, which has a train station named Union Station. And basically the students are looking at measurement is used to gather information and solve problems around the real world around us. How does measurement help us solve problems in the real world? And then they're going to start to go and they're going to talk to the engineer. They're going to figure out how much train tracks. They're going to find out about the other professionals. Different tools are used to measure different things. What tools do people use to measure things? Second grade language. But now in this instance, they're applying it to the unit on Union Station. Now, you had brought up one you wanted me to see, uh, Keena, because you had some concerns about it. Is that correct? Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is just an example of one. I thought it might be valuable to, to quickly look at um, just to show kind of how there might be an essential question and it might help give some folks in the, in the room here some ideas of how they can look at their essential questions. So this is from a, a ninth grade ELA map. Um, the name of the unit is understanding your value in the community. If I jump in here, um, I mean, you'll, you'll right away notice that there isn't necessarily an associated big idea, which I know you've already talked about, um, but we'll just pull that up. Can you see that okay on your end? I can. I hope people can too. If I, if I can see it and I've got glasses on, if you can't see it, you either need glasses or just get closer to your screen. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Here's, oh, I got a yes. Thank you, awesome. uh, Ishmael. All right. So somebody said they can see it. We kind of need that sometimes. <laughs> point. Look what's missing here. There's a couple things that I see because when I look at maps, I take on the uh, eyes of an editor and I'm trying to just give feedback. You're the author. So let's just say, Keenan, you wrote this. I, I mean, you're the author here, but I got to tell you, objectively, this is what I see, and, and this is the architecture. First of all, the name of the unit is pretty interesting, understanding your value in the community, but there's nothing about it. There's nothing about the value or the community. What, what's the big idea you want? Why are we even doing this? What this seems to be about is a skills map on how I can use and identify elements of fiction and nonfiction to create and support an original analysis of grade level text. Uh, I, I understand that that's going to be an important skill set. It seems like a restatement of a standard that's just been put in here. And I guess I'm going to be applying it to the values of that. But you, you could redo this. You need to. There should be a big idea about what this is about to just get off and running. If there could be something like um, each member of a community has value, whatever, or communities that value each member, sustain and contribute to people's lives? Or, because there are some communities where people don't. I mean, I, I mean, there's some interesting questions. So the essential question could be, and they're using your, so maybe they're talking about mine, so maybe it's first person. Um, how am I valued by my community? And then maybe conversely, how can I value and contribute to my community, sort of converse? And then you could absolutely say something about um, how interpreting, you know, the importance of um, recognizing readers who recognize elements of fiction and nonfiction glean more out of their reading. But to me, it's a disconnect that you could have a tier of this about the, the actual writing work or reading. It looks like a reading um, um, standard here. You could absolutely do that. But the idea here is that it 
it is problematic. Yes, somebody just posted that. That's 100% about IB and PYP. So the no notion of the, the, the big idea is that it, it conceptually needs to align. We don't just throw them in. That's like an architect saying, throw anything you want into the blueprint. Okay, let's get back here. All right, thank you for that. Awesome. Um, all right, I'll, I'll jump to the next one. I think you can take control, but just let me know if you want me to keep going. I'll try, okay. Um, so what we wanna do is structure the unit around a set of questions. Generally speaking, I don't think you want more than three, sometimes four. But when somebody has 10, I'm going, those aren't as all essential questions. Probably some of them are instructional questions. Kind of just make them subheads. Use the questions as the scope and sequence of the unit. Um, no, big ideas are not the same as objectives. They are not. Objectives are written in behavioral terms. Those are closer to what we'd say is a learning target. The essential question is the invitation for inquiry. It has a different function. So it, in, a, in a sense, the objectives are housed underneath that. I'm matching my objectives to the parameters of the inquiry. In curriculum, remember, you're designing a set of learning experiences and you hope to fulfill objectives in it, but the invitation for inquiry has got to be there. Otherwise, you're just walking people through, do this, do this, do this. Uh, a very good question someone just asked there, though. You want it to embrace the standards, in your case, maybe using objectives, or in IB, it could be ATLs, and you're planning, and watch this, for internal alignment using that color coding. That was what I wanted to really emphasize. So let's go, let's see if I can, I'm not there. So in a sense, and what, oops, what just happened? Darn. Here, let me, uh, oh, you got it? Okay. No, I don't. If you can go uh, It went, I think it's just a little delayed. This is important. When you think about blueprints, you think about things holding up. And one thing I want to get clear about is if I have a title of a book and I have two chapters in the book, then the pages belong someplace. I'm a writer, I've, write, I've written books. I continue to write books. And the table of contents is really important. It helps you know what's in the book and what's not. So if I handed you a book, um, let's say, um, uh, by a, uh, a very well-known author and it was in science and it had 10 chapters, but I ripped out the table of contents. All you'd have is a bunch of pages. You don't know how it's organized. But in this case, we got two chapters and all the pages belong there. So now we've got a unit of study on the rainforest. We have two essential questions, all the lesson plans, all the activities, the way we align our focus areas each will align into one of those chapters. So I can say to a student, for the next six weeks, we're studying these two questions. These are driving our inquiry. And everything we do, every activity, all of that will align back to, the, to, that, um, to those questions. Okay, next. So they're curriculum chapters. That's pretty much the point. All right, so let's keep <laughs> on going. <laughs> All right, so when we get our essential questions, then what, that, what follows is we're going to begin to look at, at some of the other choices that you make. So here's a poll first before we proceed. All right, Keenan? Yeah, I think yeah. Shinji's got it up there. Yeah, it should be up. Everyone yeah. can take a quick look at the poll. Uh, if it doesn't show, please do uh, add, you know, comment on the chat so we can fix that for you. I think I can see it, but I'm also a panelist, so I don't know if that changes things. <laughs> uh, we'll have it up for about 15 more seconds, so if everyone can answer, that'd be awesome. Great, thank you. Awesome. Okay, so we'll end the poll here. Um, here are the results, Heidi, if you wanted to take a quick look. Thank you. Great. I think that sounds, uh, sounds on, on par. It takes time. I can also tell you more than any other design tool, if we get that right, everything else flows. That is, that, to me, I'm just saying this as a coach, my opinion, years of experience, this, um, they got results that said 0%, so they didn't see what I saw, I guess. Okay. Um, uh, 
it's about 52% for I somewhat know how to design a good question. So that, that was the winner on our end. It, it takes, it, it takes time. And I would, I would say that it's a real, um, it is a real skill set, and it's like creative writing. You got to keep at it, and you know a good question when you see it, and you'll get better at it. And the way you really know is your students get more engaged. Let's talk a little bit briefly about content and skills. There's what is it we want no students to know, and be able to do, and and we're seeing that now as elements. These are elements where you make choices in your maps. I'm okay. Content is the subject matter itself. It's the key concepts, it's the facts and events, it's the information, it's the books you choose. It's gotta be relevant and timely. It needs to be salient. So one of the hardest things about content, it's not what you're going to teach, it's what you're not going to teach because you can't do everything. That I think is something the general public doesn't realize. I actually think it's the hardest of all the elements. I really do is there's so many interesting things and so much good information and we have more than ever. And the irony is, is most schools still run on roughly 180 day school year, which is the exact same year amount of time as we had in the 1890s. So I, I think that um, the, the, the content question is absolutely central here. And as you're mapping, you're gonna to need to make those decisions in a way that makes um, good sense moving forward. As you make these decisions, there's a menu of options to choose from. You can design content to be discipline-based, so it's within a subject area as long as it's active, so not just to study science, but to be scientist. You could do parallel connections. In other words, let's go back to maybe, again, I'm teaching literature, and Keenan, you're teaching social studies, and we are studying World War II again, and I'm going to do literature of that time, and I'm going to run it at the same time you're doing World War II history, but we're not designing for connections. We're running concurrently. That is not the same as interdisciplinary, where let's say all of us, the three of us, all are designing a unit together and bringing in statistics and demographics. And that's the one maybe life on the war front, life on the home front, and we deliberately design them together. Interdisciplinary is very common in elementary. Phenomena-based is different. Phenomena-based is what I would say arguably is absolutely transdisciplinary. I think it's different, but I don't, I prefer using phenomena based because I don't think it has the word discipline in it. You see, interdisciplinary, I'm looking at the nature of each discipline and what it adds. I'm deliberately still working within the subject, which has great value. Phenomena based is what's, it's, 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 it transcends it and it's emergent. It is emergent from the student's world. It is not something you planned in advance. It could be COVID. We didn't, nobody had this on their curriculum calendar a year and a half ago. And it could be an experience students having at home. It could be an area of interest. It could be something that helps a student want to aspire to something. And the one country I visited where they actually require uh, thoughtfully designed phenomena-based experiences is Finland. And what's interesting is, is to see that there's more of this emerging. Next-gen science standards, for those of you who use them in the United States, definitely tilt towards more phenomena-based experimentation. So that is not about the subjects at all. It's about what's emergent, where as good interdisciplinary is. I love this stuff because I think it expands the possibilities for how you map. Here's the point. In your chalk software or in your mapping, you can do any of these. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to stay within a subject, but you can. And you can do a good job along, those, along the way. Let's keep rolling. Could you do the next slide, please, Keenan? Thank you. Yeah, uh, just really quickly wanted to highlight with this one, um, when you're creating your maps, there are different options that you can use kind of to Heidi's point so that it makes it easy to dive in and use a structure that maps directly to how you wanna create your content. Cool, so you can have different templates that correspond. That's great, thank you. Let's go to the next one. So. Basically, this is a quick sidebar. The first book I ever wrote was on interdisciplinary. And this, these, this, I love this look at epistemology. I really do, because I think the, the design of knowledge is fascinating. I think one of the best courses ever written is the IB theory of knowledge course. I, I, I wish more students were exposed to the idea that knowledge creation is a form of learning architecture and is utterly fascinating. 
So point though, is as I'm looking at an organizing concept and I'm looking at it through the lens of math, what might a mathematician ask about or a scientist ask about, we can see that this, this really allows the essential questions ultimately to be the connector. So if you go to the next slide, if I don't do this, it's primarily then parallel. But if I do use the essential questions and I do look for common connections, then let's say I'm doing a unit on flight and I ask the question, what flies and how? Can ideas fly? How does flight affect people's lives? I'm cutting across the subject areas to address those questions. So one another, I just wanna make that bonus point about EQs. I think they're really important. Let's continue on, thank you. So content is the what we teach. And first is to determine the format you're going to use. And then you're going to be looking at what it is you want students to know. And you'll be populating your map in the knowledge and content with the most salient points. So I'm gonna to have to make a decision of what I think is most important when I'm introducing students to um, states of matter, maybe in fourth grade. And I'm going to put the content there, but it'll go back to that essential question. Content is primarily nouns, just for the record. It's what? It's the key facts and topics, events for that matter. Skills, what is it we want our students to do? Written proficiencies, techniques, they all start with action verbs. They're observable. You'll see a lot of skill works, a lot of skill language embedded in standards. Many of you know this, but the key thing here is that it begins with something you can see. So a skill, you, you would never use the word, verb understand for a skill because you can't teach it. Johnny, go understand for a while. Come back, do some understanding and I'll see you when you get better at it. But I could have him explain the reason. I can have him demonstrate, but I can't, I can't have verbs that are, are not clear. You've got to have something that's teachable and learnable, really. Let's go to the next slide. So it's precision expe expectation is crucial to skill development. So when I'm looking at a map and skills are vague or general or something like reading, that's too general. You know, it's like a coach in tennis isn't going to just say, play tennis better, play better. It's not going to be that. It's going to have to do with the, the, the toss of the ball on the serve. I'm working on a specific skill. Skills are precise. I think that's an important thing. And maps can help you make choices about what's, what are some of those most essential skills as you in fact, even address the content. What do we want, it, what do we want kids to know be able to do are also married. This is a communal household here in this, this wonderful map we're doing. Okay. Next slide. So here's an example from a unit, um, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, and had some really good questions. It's a very good title, TKM, Somebody Else's Shoes. And one of the things they were looking at, one of the first questions was, um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was, is justice, are we born, is justice um, bred or are we born Injustice, is injustice bred or are we born with it? Something like that, which is great. And as we go through, the teacher, you notice is using action verbs. They're color coding it back. They're looking at some of the factors they'll explain in the content. The next essential question had to do with how, how, do, how do characters grow when they encounter challenges or something like that. And so the point here, as we go through, we see that we're putting in what we think will be good matches between the skills and the content, but it's entered with enough precision so that in fact, as another teacher, I could read it. But if it's vague, then we don't get anything from it. It shouldn't be filler, if that makes sense. Next point. So again, and bear with us, this is, a, you know, our goal was to, to finish up around uh, 75 minutes. So. We don't have a lot of time here. And so this, these, any one of these, <laughs> we could take a dive in. And I love doing that, by the way. I'm really helping teachers get this because it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Formative and summative assessment. Here's a few key points. And let me try again. 
take your time. We're enjoying it. Thanks. <laughs> I'm, enjoying it. <laughs> I think I'm getting sunshine all over me right now. I think I just want you to know I'm not trying to do it. An effect of the light being the light is shining on me like something special. It's just it's the light on my eyes. Okay. Um, all right, here we go. Let's see. All right, assessments. Oh, that was, I don't oh, here we go. I got it. Okay. Here I'll get. I'll get. I got it here. I think we're good. I think it's a little better actually if you do it, Kenny. Okay, assessments cool. and demonstrations of learning. They're evidence. You know, where's the pudding? The proofs and the pudding, as we say. So when you when you if you have objectives or you have your essential questions or you want to know what kids are want, need to know and be able to do, how do you know it? By what they produce, they say, they make, they build, they compute, not by what we cover. So the evidence can either be tangible, something I can pick up and look at or view, or it can be in an observable performance, more temporal in nature. So it could be a speech in class is temporal, but I can observe it. A tangible product could be an examination. It could be a photo essay, it could be a gallery. So the point here is we don't just teach at kids. We are, we are teaching with them. Standards are things they demonstrate. We are looking at what will be the primary formative. So we're looking at assessment for learning, ongoing, sort of the rehearsal level, and what will be summative along, along the way. Let's go to the next slide. Assessments should be aligned to the elements. They're coded in. They can be summative or formative, and they inform us also how we can make revisions that provide a launching pad uh, for our learners to draw lessons, directions, and become self-evaluating. So the assessments we put in, we do want to recognize that we'll be, when we get to the lesson plan level, which we aren't getting into today, we absolutely need to look at how do we set up our grouping? How do we differentiate it? Maybe we scale it. Maybe we provide an array. What we want to do as a district or in a school is we've got to put on the table what we think are the most revealing forms of evidence so that our teachers can review them effectively. Let's go to the next slide. You know what? I'm going to fix this here. How is that? Better, I think. Thank you. Excuse me for that. Okay, um, but this is real life. How's that? <laughs> uh, all right, so there's three tiers of assessment. This I really love. And one thing I wanna get clear about, and this could be a whole other deal, and we're going to talk more about assessment in our last session. But think about it in terms of performance areas because kids all understand this, but it's true in every subject. There's drill and practice. Do we need it? Absolutely. It's repetitive, but it's based on skill sets and I practice on the granular so I can get better at the game. The whole point of drill and practice is for me to be able to do it on my own so I can improve. If I don't know what to do differently, I can't improve. It's not busy work. So in an area like soccer, there's drill and practice and then there's, there's rehearsal and scrimmage. Scrimmage is where we run plays. I can blow the whistle as the coach. I can bring you to the side. We can work on it, but we're, it's, it's a sort of simulation. Then there's the authentic performance, the game. That's when you find out I'm a player and where is the teacher? They're on the sidelines. And if they run out on the, on the playing field, they're out of there. So the same thing would be true in music. The same thing would be true in a math class. But if I never get a chance to play the game, I lose interest. So one of the things mapping allows you to do, and the reason I'm saying you have to put what's seminal out here, is if I look at a school year and nobody gets a chance, if these kids don't get a chance to authentically, I'm not talking about good applications in a classroom class, that could be a rehearsal. I'm talking about they really get to use their skill sets in a genuine and authentic way. They lose some interest and you don't have to have a lot of them. Let's go to the next slide. So for example, um, let's say I'm looking at a, um, um, a, 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 a game or I look at a, a, music, a, a music performance. Keenan, if you were running the orchestra program in a high school, how many concerts in a year do you think you'd have? Probably two, but you have them. You know, there's a lot more scrimmage and drill than there is the game. 
But if I don't get to see the see myself play, I really lose interest. Periodically, students have to actually carry out real science. They actually really do need to publish the things they write, but, and whether they give them out to family or friends or they put them somewhere else and get them out there. We need to have opportunities for students to see what it looks like in real and authentic settings. Next slide, please. So key factors, and we'll touch on this a little bit more because we're gonna look at unpacking assessment data of various kinds. But authentic is it's a genuine application. It's a real situation. It's place-based. Please hear me on that. It's not simulated. Like I could do a really good simulation game. I would love to do that, but that's a rehearsal. But it's actually anchored in a real situation. And it could be place-based, meaning it was my experience. I wanna write a short story, that's authentic. It could be local, it could be, it could be in your neighborhood, it could be a situation globally, it could be using virtual tools, but it's an actual situation where I get to really use these skill sets. And there's always an audience. An audience could be the recip recipients of the service learning, a real opportunity of service. It could be somebody's giving you expert advice on a capstone project. Well, one thing I just want to point out is the overwhelming majority of what if what's going on in school is mainly rehearsal and drill. Then, in fact, you really start to lose your kids. And I think that's a, a huge problem. Let's go to the next one. So finally, I think one of my favorites is this one. I always ask this question with teachers. I'll go, OK, you know what's authentic also is if it's timely. So what do modern scientists, mathematicians, historians, writers, different fields produce? They don't produce five paragraph essays. That's a rehearsal and it's an important one, but no, they do not do that. They don't. So the point here is what do they do? Let's take a look at the next set. We are, need to start to look at more modern types of assessment types. I put this in a book I wrote on active literacy um, and it got a huge amount of attention. I'm upgrading it now, I'm even adding more that the point here is if I, instead of, so we do a lot of instead of, so we can go through our maps, you see, for timeliness and start to go, you know what? Instead of a, a, a poster, maybe it's a podcast. Instead of a simple design, maybe I have a make an infographic. Uh, I was with a group of um, science teachers at a high school who were interviewing some professionals at a, a, a laboratory and it, virtually, and they and they and the kids said, "Well, what is it you produce?" And they said, "Grant proposals." <laughs> so guess what the teacher had them do? She had them do a real grant proposal for a real location. The point here is, you want to get your kids excited, then have them do work that's really relevant. Do you do this all the time? No. It, it, you know, teachers, oh, I don't have time. I'm going. Well, you, you say that to the music teacher. I wish we had time for a concert. I mean, it makes no sense to me. It's just you're not doing it every minute. But you've got to think about this. And so mapping allows you to go where are the most fruitful places to allow this to happen. Next slide. So to what extent are you assessing on all three tiers? Let's take a look at that question. Could share in your chat. Yeah, I saw one earlier. While you were going through them, somebody mentioned uh, it's up there now uh, in their ICT course how they have students develop an app idea to solve a problem that they're having today. And I, I know I've Absolutely worked with right. some. Absolutely right. That's exactly right. As is, is there's so many important opportunities for us to have kids create assessments that show what they can do. I, I would say that a lot of people have developed as districts some good common benchmark performance tasks. But I'm gonna argue those are rehearsals and very important rehearsals. They're dress rehearsals, but it is not the same. It just simply is not. The point here is give me a chance at some point, even with the youngest stages, to be able to communicate what they're doing. I have examples from pre-Ks 
of kids doing authentic performances and authentic demonstrations of learning in real context. I, I, it's one of the most interesting things to do with mapping. And let's continue on, I'm keeping an eye on our time here. But thanks for all these, you're putting in so many. So we will not spend a lot of time on this one, but it is a whole other arena of work and that's the design of the lesson plan. So in a sense, the, the design of the unit is, is like the blueprint that is the architect. And then we turn it over to build in our classroom. Let's go to the next slide. And that relationship then is as follows. We do, the, we do the unit design based on what matters most. We then convert it into daily plans. So next slide, please. So the analogy that I like to give is this one. Oh, sorry. Oh, never mind. I think it's there. Yeah, yeah. next slide, please. Yeah. There we go, sorry. It's like the construction foreman's daily plan. So. I take, I take my blueprint, I give it to the construction crew, they're building it. But if the, if the construction crew doesn't have a blueprint and they just have a lot of materials, they're just gonna be kept busy. So the idea here is that the lesson plans align back to those unit goals and targets. Um, I've been doing an enormous amount of work this year on streamlining lesson plan models and uh, we're not going to really get into that so much in, 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 the, in, the, in this workshop series, but perhaps we can touch on a little bit. But to me, I just think lesson planning is far too cumbersome. It's, it's almost become nightmarish, frankly, during COVID, where kids get tons and tons of lists of tasks. And there's some really exciting new approaches. And there's one called learning sets at some point. But here's the point about what we're doing today. There's a place for you to do planning that would make it infinitely easier and more efficient using your software right now, if I'm not mistaken. Isn't that yeah. correct? Yeah, so let's let's dive in and show that real quick. I do wanna be mindful of the time, so I'll, I'll try and be brief and hopefully pique folks' interest in this. Um, just really highlighting, so we've talked a lot about curriculum mapping, unit planning and unit design and all, all those components uh, from the chalk environment at least are built right into our curriculum solution. This is something that's universal to your school, to your district, to your institution, so that everyone's kind of collaboratively working on those pieces together and you're working from that central blueprint as, as Dr. Jacobs put it. And I wanna switch gears here, kind of looking at the lesson planning side, and this is a lot more geared towards the individual teacher. So this is where you can really take those blueprints as a resource and use it as one input and you as a professional are able to then kind of craft lessons and craft engaging resources for students to interact with and how you're gonna go about teaching those things. So what we're looking at here, and I don't wanna to get too deep into it. There's a lot of really great things that we can highlight. Um, but one thing I will note is that PlanBoard itself is a free tool. There might be many of you here today who are already using PlanBoard. Um, and so I would encourage you if you're interested, uh, if you go to chalk.com slash PlanBoard, you can go log in and create an account right away and start playing around with this. It is flexible in that you can create it whether you're an early learning or an elementary teacher, or maybe you're in a middle school, high school teacher, Teacher. You can really structure it to meet your needs. And as you're working through, um, not only can you use this to help keep your content organized. So in this example here, if we were to start putting uh, our lesson plan on To Kill a Mockingbird, we'll put a title in there. We can jump in here and start adding content. Um, not only do we have this kind of empty canvas to work with, but we do have direct access to those unit plans that we were looking at earlier. So in some of the examples we were showing, we can see how those big ideas are shown in here and the essential questions. We can go through and understand what are the different types of assessments and activities that we're gonna be doing. And if these are things that we're gonna be using in our daily plans, we can use these options to pull those directly in and again, it's a starting point. You think of this as more of a menu than a script and really being able to leverage the resources that are available to then come back and craft and organize these for yourself individually. Um, like I said, there's a lot of different things I can highlight for you. There are templates and different ways that you can structure this to just help you save time. And especially mid, <laughs> as a teacher, if there's one thing I learned in doing this and working with teachers, that time is probably the most essential resource that you all have. So. Um, this is one way that we hope this tool can help save that time. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Like I said, if you are interested and want to learn more about that and are curious to kind of play with it, 
chalk.com slash plan board. And it's a free tool for individual teachers to sign up for. And you can jump into that and see how that might work for you. Um, and because of the, I do want to be mindful of the time. Um, we, we did want to plan on diving into some q and I am more than happy to stick around. I do want to be very respectful of Dr. Jacobs taking your time today. I, I, I just want to check with you. Are you okay with answering one or two questions or, or how are we looking on time on your end? Here's what I'd like to do. Okay. I'd actually like, I'm, I'm okay with that. First, I want to go to the contact information because people yep. are going to sign up. And I've already been, re people are reaching me and asking. This is how you can reach me. And uh, that's my website. That's my email address. Oops, somebody changed the Twitter again. You got to fix that. There's oh. no S. Yeah, I, I took that off on purpose, you guys. <laughs> There's no S. There you go. Because Twitter won't allow that many letters. I mean, you're right. My last name is Jacobs, but it happens to be that. <laughs> so there go talk to Twitter. I actually don't. They got enough problems right now. <laughs> Oh, uh, this is my contact information. I just, I, I had a lot of people ask me last time, so feel free yep. to reach out. Very good. Okay, so sure. Um, why don't we, uh, realistically, why don't we just go to 4.30 uh, our time? Let's go to, let's, let's Sure, let's, yeah, let's that, that, that works we'll, for us. All right, that's fine. And so for I, those of you who, are, who elect to uh, cut out, thank you for joining us. I hope you found this of value and thank you to Chalk. That's great. All right, uh, let's dive in. So we've got a question here from Nicholas um, and I'll just read it out here. It's, I think it's a really good one. I've, I've definitely heard some things in this vein before. Uh, how do you convince teachers who are under pressure to cover a syllabus before the exam to take the time to rethink their approach as a conceptual one? How can you guarantee that you will hit all the desired benchmarks and standards when working from big ideas and essential questions? I think, those are, I think there's several questions embedded in that. I don't think it's just one question, but I think they're very good questions. Um, I think that, um, uh, let's, take, let's take it, um, the first part of that. Um, I don't feel I have to convince anybody. I really don't. I think the shoe's on the other foot. I think the, the bottom line here is, if we start with one agreement, only one agreement, and that is any decision we make moving forward we have to argue over what is in the best interest of the kids, that's it. And somebody has to show me how it's in the student's best interest not to review and update their curriculum. I would never go to a doctor who said, I'm just really comfortable with how I've been doing this for 15 years. It's not okay. So the first point are some agreements about that. One, two, is I think you have to be patient. I also don't think it's all at once. And, you know, we have, what, an hour and a half here today, and you get a lot of ideas across based on a lot of work. And um, I, I know you can get most teachers to step up. I really know that. I've seen it. But I think you have to be fair to people. And, you know, we talk about differentiated instruction, but we need professional, differentiated professional development. I think some people just need a little bit of support on certain skill sets. Here's the other thing is we're designing for engagement. And if somebody has got a curriculum that's really got those kids engaged and productive, then great, more power to them. I want to learn from them. But if in fact uh, they don't, if in fact what you see is a malaise, students aren't caring so much, they're not as engaged, we have a problem. And I think the idea here is to look at it in that regard. Secondly, the dilemma of trying to do all the standards is you can't. I love these, this question. Whoever asked it, I just love it because it's right up front. I really do. You can't, well, nobody does that. You can't. And you're not teaching them anyway. They're demonstrating. There's this whole, it's not even a movement. It's like common practice now on priority standards. I mean, we're all hearing about it. Power standards. There's a reason because there's too many of them and they're not all equal. They're Come get me. I'm saying <laughs> it's it's clustering. And in fact, this morning, I was on for two hours with a wonderful rural district, a big county in the United States, in the central part of the United States. That's a lot of kids who are struggling and they're trying to make sense of it. They are organizing, they're looking at their state standards and they're gonna bundle them. We're gonna set we're gonna set priorities about what matters most 
and also how to engage them and what would be points of access for kids who sometimes don't have that many resources and how do you you know, you've got to take this curriculum and design it to reach the students. The point of the standards isn't that we're victims of them. It's to, it's to make sense of them. And if anyone says, I worked on all the standards, I'm going, who are you? That is just, first of all, notice the pronoun. That might be interesting, but what did your kids do? So I, th I think the idea is, is to really look realistically at a target match between who the students are and who the standards are and to recognize that standards aren't curriculum. They're not, they're proficiency targets looking for a place to live in your school year. They're, they don't tell you what to teach, how to teach. In, in fact, even that example, Keenan, the one you pulled up, the one where it was about valuing your community and all it had was the standard. I, I'm like, but what are they gonna do with it? And, and by the way, it was the broadest standard I've ever seen in my life, just for the record. I'm. It was like, I can read both all of fiction and nonfiction and find the reasons behind it. I'm going, please, you can't, nobody can do all that. What, wouldn't you go to the subset? That looked almost like the header. It, it, it was sort of, in my view, a misunderstanding, a well-intended piece. But the, the, the purpose of these standards would be like a spine to really help us, but they're not, the idea is, a, is, 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 is how we lay them out. I can really go on a roll on this, so I better stop. But I, <laughs> well, I, I mean, other, you're... I, I have only one other thing. I think this is important. Sure, <laughs> sure. Okay, the standards are written in grade level bands, but everybody knows there's a wide range of kids in anybody's in all these classes. So, the other thing is to be realistic about where your kids are. Some of your kids are significantly past what the grade level standards are, so they they are not meant to. They are meant to be a kind of spinal piece, not. I've got to do all these in that grade level. That kind of mentality is, is making people nuts, I think. It's just way too much burden and it's just not real or their intention. That's not my view. I don't. Uh, Next question. One, for another one? Yeah, so this is a bit of a, a, a I kind of want to pose it a little bit because there's been a, quite a few about this, about recommendations of literature for developing and understanding essential questions. And, and there's someone who kind of put a good idea of like, can you tweet some literature on your topic? So it might be a good incentive for folks to go follow Heidi on Twitter. Um, sure. But while we're here, um, is there any that you would recommend? And I don't, we can maybe put them in the chat and we can definitely kind of, we've got this recorded and documented. It might be something in addition we can add in. Uh, so when we're good. sharing out the recording for folks. I have them. Um, I, I wrote the foreword. It was my honor to write the foreword to what I think is the best book on it called A Guide to Writing Central Questions by Jay McTighe and Grant Wiggins. And it was right before the late, great Grant Wiggins passed away. It is the best book I know out there. I love that book. That would be my number one recommendation. I really would. And uh, like I say, I, I know I knew Grant. I'm very good friends with Jay. And I'm not just saying that. I think it's it's the best one out there. I'll post some things on Twitter. There's also, gosh, and it slips my mind. There's a, a wonderful group in New Zealand. What's it called? What's W W Nobby or something like that. They they have a great set of materials and resources. Um, I, I'll 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 make a point of doing some something tonight. I'll post something there and, and I'll share that with the group. How are we doing on time? I guess we've reached our match. Yeah, I think yeah. we're at the end. Uh, I'll hand it over to Shinjini to wrap us out here. Yeah, perfect. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs. I think it was quite a informative session. And I think a lot of people got a lot out of it. Uh, so we really do appreciate your time um, here. If anybody has any you know, questions or wants to learn a little bit more about Dr. Jacobs' work, uh, please feel free to reach out to her or through a chop uh, but we thank you for our session today and we'll see if you're our last session next thursday at the same time at 3 p.m um, i'll update our calendar invite as well so you have that available in your google calendar or any other calendar you're using but i think until next thursday uh, i hope you have a wonderful and safe uh, week thanks everyone thank you, everybody. we'll see you next time